Welcome to our catch-up lecture, lecture uh, nine from last week, and uh, we'll attempt to get this lecture out as well as lecture ten uh, and get everybody caught up. So, uh, if you approach that study guide that was due this that's due this week, um, answers to be submitted on Canvas, and as you might have watched any of the videos, the optional Gestalt stuff there you realize that what we're about to enter into is some very different stuff. And keep in mind that the, the past eight weeks or so have been an opportunity to kind of get ready for this. This is the big gun in dream work. And if you haven't had any kind of breakthrough in understanding your dream as of yet, that uh, hopefully this approach will open it up. We're, we've still got a couple things to do after the Gestalt approach, but this is the big one. Um, we did have a small class last Tuesday of five persons. Uh, you know, I really want to thank them for coming and, and braving the conditions as they are. Um, we were able to do a class and step through this lecture and to um, actually work with a Gestalt approach. And if it's possible, if I have a couple of students willing to volunteer and somebody to record it, we'll actually try and... and uh, do a demonstration and, and present it here on Canvas uh, in a video. Uh, one of the things that you're going to get back this week is your is comments on your assignment too. And in those comments, I have some uh, observations from the work in the actual assignment and then some stuff for you to be thinking about doing in assignment three. And it's those things I'm going to ask you to approach in assignment or assignment study guide the study guide that's due, that we'll start working on this week. And I'm still in the process of getting that together, making some modifications for our online type of work that we'll be doing. Um, but consider uh, the feedback you're getting. You're probably scratching your head going, hmm, assignment three, be the piano, that sort of stuff. It's like, we're going to get to that. Just keep that in mind for a little bit. We're going to go through the background stuff in assignment two, a lot of this will parallel your reading. Hopefully you've done that for the study guide uh, as a bit of background for this approach. And we'll point out some key differences between what we've done before with the with Jung's approach and now with the Gestalt approach. So one of the things that's different is now we don't talk about complexes anymore. We talk about unfinished business or another way to express basically the same thing is an incomplete Gestalt. So Gestalt is a German word with no equivalent uh, translation in English, but roughly it means to make whole or to become whole. W-H-O-L-E, whole. Wholeness is a thing. Now, this isn't really different than Jung in that way that to become whole meant to become what, who one is, right? To develop those traits, to develop the personality. And here in the Gestalt approach, we don't have a theory of the unconscious. He's borrowing more from Gestalt psychology and some of their principles, like foreground and background, uh, but not a, a theory of the unconscious. So we don't talk about shadow and complexes and stuff like that. Uh, we'll talk about instead unfinished business or incomplete gestalts. Projection is still a major factor. We mentioned this in the Jungian approach, that projection allows us the opportunity to become aware of this stuff that's unconscious. In Gestalt, we have an opportunity to become aware of the things of which we're not aware of. We won't necessarily call them unconscious. Uh, and the definition here, according to the Pearls, Hefferline, and Goodman book, uh, projection is a trait, attitude, feeling, or a bit of behavior which actually belongs to your own personality but is not experienced as such. Instead, it is attributed to other persons or objects in the environment and then experienced as directed toward you by them instead of the other way around. So here, Pearls is telling us how we experience a projection. It's something that's not from us. It's from others. It's sort of like the the projection bounces back. And here, in, in that way, gives us an opportunity to observe it. Uh, it does take a bit of work, as we noticed with Jung. Uh, to, to reel in this projection requires us to develop a sense of awareness and to be vulnerable enough to work with them. From the Gestalt perspective, everything in the dream is a projection of the dreamer's own personality. So here we're dealing specifically with the subjective level of interpretation we had in Jung. The dream is about the dreamer and the dreamer's personality. 
And so what we see in the dream is a projection of these parts of ourselves, and some of them are owned, you know, some of them we identified with, they've assimilated into our identity, and other parts of the the dream we'll see it will experience as alien or other. In any case, these things are all projected on the screen of the of the dream, right, and then reflected back to us. And now we're going to work on the perspective of how we're going to become aware of these things and what they might mean to us from the Gestalt perspective. So let's let's go ahead with that. Gestalt and dreams, Gestalt therapy and dreams. Uh, the dream is an existential message. So when we say existential now, we mean it's a message about our existence. And it's from the dreamer to the dreamer. So it's a message from ourselves to ourselves about what's missing in, the, in our lives. And what the dreamer, what we as a dreamer, is avoiding doing and being. So it sounds harsh, and yet he's right on the money. It's, this is not an inaccurate statement at all. What's missing in the dream, what's avoided, and first bullet here, parts of the dreamer's own waking personality. So these are the parts of which we uh, are not aware of, and sometimes we attribute to others you know, through projection. The clues to finding the missing parts of the personality lie in the projections of the dreamer, bringing these projections to awareness and then bringing them to life. That's going to be an important part of this work. Overall, what the dreamer is avoiding in waking life is the ongoing process of maturing and being responsible for himself and herself. Okay, to understand this a bit, we have to understand something about Pearl's idea that the mature person does not rely on his tools of manipulation, manipulating the environment, people in the environment to get his needs met. The mature person takes responsibility for his needs and develops the resources in order to meet those needs. Uh, if we can't do this, then we rely on manipulation. If we can't rely on manipulation, then what do we do? We starve to death. You know, the need doesn't get fulfilled. So to become aware allows us the choice and the maturity then is sort of the driving factor in that to become mature, to, be, to exist, and to live one's own life. Um, that we need to develop the resources in order to allow us to take care of ourselves. Uh, Pearls is still interested in neurosis, and if you've watched the the films that I've put links to for this this week between week nine and ten, you know, to get you ready for week ten, uh, he might have talked about neurosis. And if he hasn't, he will talk about it sooner or later. And he borrows. It, it seems that he's borrowing some ideas from Karen Horney. Uh, he and Jung were not friends, and I, I don't think he and Horney were friends for that matter either. But there'll be some similarities, and there'll be some differences in the way Pearls uh, talks about neurosis. And here he's saying the neurotic person interrupts the ongoing process of life and saddles himself with so many unfinished situations that he cannot get on satisfactorily with the process of life. I mean, you, if you didn't know Pearls wrote this, you might think that Hornite wrote it. I mean, it. It kind of fits. We don't have to fit these two together, but I think it, it aligns pretty well with Hornite's idea. And we had in, in Horney's case that the neurotic character structure was basically overcomplicated and that these complications prevented the person from having the energy uh, and mental processes available to go on with life, you know, that they're stuck in the past. And Pearls now is telling us that the, the interruption is due to the energy that's being put into these unfinished situations and, and the inability to complete the gestalts that all of these unfinished situations are clogging up the psyche, so to speak, or, well, let's jump from Jung into Pearls. They're clogging up the, our, all of our mental energy and not being completed, and this is stifling us. The unfinished situations, basically, I mean, if, since we came from a background with Jung, we can say the unfinished situations look a heck of a lot like complexes. And we'll see a same characteristic of them in these patterns of avoidance that happen around the unfinished situation and also happen around the complex. They're very similar. And if, you, if you've done the study guide, you know, question 10, part A, you know, it looks at that 
that paragraph by Fans from your reading and basically what she's describing around an incomplete gestalt or an unfinished situation. And from a Jungian perspective, you know, you're looking at a complex. So the answer to part A there is complexes or shadow. And a shadow is a specific kind of complex. Uh, some of the past is assimilated and carried with us. I mean, that's we identify this as part of our personality. The parts that aren't assimilated and carried around as unfinished situations or incomplete gestalts. And this is the stuff that zaps our energy, that keeps us stuck in neurotic uh, character styles, and that uh, encourages us to avoid becoming mature. Resentment, according to Fritz Perls, is one of the worst forms of unfinished business. Now, I probably should have introduced him before, but Fritz Perls is considered the the finder or founder or the refinder of the Gestalt approach. Um, his name is actually Frederick Perls, and he just got nicknamed Fritz, and it stuck to him, and he can, you know, called himself Fritz all the time. Um, he died in the 1970s, so he outlived Jung by a few years. Um, he was a rascally old guy. If you've seen the videos, you know he's uh, he's quite a character, but he's absolutely brilliant, and he gives himself a lot of credit, and credit is due. I mean, he, he is very brilliant. He has discovered a way to push through uh, this problem of unfinished business, or what he'll later call the impasse, um, not only to push through it, but begin to integrate these parts of ourselves that we've rejected or projected out into the world. And resentment, yes, I would agree with Pearls here, not that it matters to him. Resentment is one of the worst forms of unfinished business, and after teaching this class 14 years and going through numerous assignments uh, and you know, grading assignments and working with students, resentment is a sticky problem. It, it seems to linger longer than it needs to and way past any amount of time that it's healthy to have it. And resentment prevents us from completing these incomplete gestalts or unfinished situations or unfinished business. And once we identify that and begin to mature, we can, we can close this situation. You know, there'll be a little f fighting. There'll be a street fight around it, but it, it's possible to do it. We can ask the question, well, how do I know I have unfinished business? I feel pretty complete. And the answer comes back to avoiding. What do I avoid in life? What do I avoid doing? What do I avoid being? And if you're still dreaming, and Pearls tells us the dream is about what we're avoiding doing and being in life. If you don't know what your unfinished business is, we'll look at the dream. Awareness, I'm calling awareness the antidote to avoidance. It's not the cure. I don't know that there is a cure for avoidance, but awareness is an antidote. It allows us to uh, actually take on this, this unfinished business and work with it. And we work in the safety of the here and now, only in the here and now. We don't go back to the past. We don't go out to the future. Any of these attempts to go to the past or the future are, are signs of avoidance. And so we bring it back to the present. And we'll even use some Zen techniques, some Zen processes, like breathe, breathing in awareness, being in the present moment. And here the safety comes from now, in the present, as an adult, the things that scared the stuffings out of you, the things that created these unfinished situations where you were overpowered, where you didn't have the resources you need, now as an adult, when we face it, we don't need to be afraid of that. Also, in the here and now, that situation isn't here. You know, we can experience it through a memory, right? We can experience it by bringing it to life. And yet, here, in the here and now, we have the safety of being an adult and not having this dragon or mother complex or whatever it is attacking us. We work in the here and now. We have that amount of safety to work with. The Gestalt approach. We don't need associations, descriptions, waking context, or as Pearls really didn't like Freud, he said we don't need to freely dissociate you know, from th these things and go back to the past, in the present, with the dream. We have everything we need. And Pearls, is, he dislikes storytelling. He doesn't like role-playing. All this is avoidance. You know, We want to get to the nitty-gritty. What's the unfinished business and how that's keeping us stuck. And Pearls used to say, you know, it's the awareness of how we're stuck, of the how that we're stuck, that enables us to become free. So we don't need any of the other stuff. Now, in our defense, I'm going to say, 
we've worked with the Jung's approach to dreams to kind of open this up to a psychological approach to dreams and also to kind of prepare. We've we've explored the unconscious a bit. We've looked at shadow and complexes and other stuff. And now we're ready to kind of open that up a lot more. Also, where we ended with Jung, with your drawing, was you know, a, a, a slight dive into um, active imagination. Now, active imagination is a bit tricky. It's kind of a tightrope walk between conscious and unconscious. Pearl's approach with existential being and the empty chair allows us to to get to that same material but without the tightrope the other side of this is it's full-on beingness tends to use a lot of energy it brings feeling body awareness everything to the surface it's all on you know everything is in play when you're doing this Uh, also as we discovered last week the five students who were able to come to class uh, we all worked together in a in a small group and explored this gestalt approach. It works very quickly, and man, does it nail stuff! And it brings things to the surface that have been, you know, kind of lurking beneath, sort of like Jung and active imagination. What's there and what's ready? And Pearls tells us the most urgent, unfinished situation is the one that's going to emerge. That's the big thing. It's going to emerge if we give it the opportunity. Okay, sorry, I strayed away from this slide. We go to the middle point. The stuff in the dreams all belongs to and is part of the dreamer's waking personality. So this is a continuity approach, not a compensation approach. Uh, The projections in the dream must be brought to life through being. The dreamer must take on the existential being of each image, character, person, etc. in the dream. Ideally, as with Jung, we'd want to do association to every image. We find it's just not practical in the learning approach to do this. We're going to take out some number, three, four, five of these things, and we're going to bring them to life. And I've, I'm pointing out to you in the feedback on your uh, assignment number two where I'd like you to start. Uh, and then you may not take on all the things. For some of you, there might be five, six. For others, there may be 15. You know, take some of those on in this next study guide, and we'll work on being these images. So we're not imagining, not imagining that you're this thing, you're being this thing. And that where this comes from is the idea that these are parts of ourselves that we've projected and we want to bring them to life. Change the it into an I, you know, to bring this to life and look at what is it trying to teach us. Each of these things has a kind of intelligence of its own. It may be a bizarre intelligence, but it has an intelligence of its own. And to bring it back to life, it's going to inform us about what this is. Ultimately, we're looking. Oops, excuse me. We're looking for polarities and existential conflicts. So polarities are those things that uh, work against each other in a couple of ways. And one way is like they meet each other head on. You know, they're banging into each other. They're pushing. Another way uh, is that they're pulling each other apart. And in either case, we find that the energy is at that stuck point. It's at that in between these two polarities, these poles of opposites. The existential conflicts, again, existential refers to being. Being and non-being. Living and dead. Alive and dead. And even um, to the point of authentic being versus inauthentic being. And and Sharp has kind of filled us in on, on this. The, the, the cost of living inauthentically, of living the life of, of, of the demands of the world, of peer, of friends, you know, of, of even of teachers, that these don't represent who we really are. And so this conflict, this existential conflict, comes down to this matter of living authentically versus inauthentically. And this is one of the kind of essential conflicts that we'll be looking for over the next couple of weeks as we work towards some solution of the dream with the Gestalt approach. Once the polarities and conflicts are discovered, we'll have the dreamer confront the unfinished situation and attempt to close the gestalt. We'll use a procedure that Pearl's called the empty chair. Basically, there are two chairs going on. One is the hot seat. So typically, when Pearl's worked with dreams, he worked with dreams in groups. So the person working would be on the hot seat. Then there'd be a chair in the middle of the circle, which was the empty chair. And so we'd have a confrontation between the dreamer and another element of the dream, or the dreamer 
being one element of the dream and having a confrontation with another. Anyway, hopefully we'll be able to resolve this in a way that you can understand it. Again, that, that cost to us to, to miss these classes is you know, your opportunity to work, for us to work together, you know, to really get a great idea of how this will work. And again, if we can uh, find some people and some resources, uh, we'll hope to do a, a demonstration video and hopefully that will make it more clear. In the meantime, we've got the videos, we have some written examples that you can look at, and then you'll have your own experience. And the last slide for this week, that all of this has to occur in a continuum of awareness. If we're not aware of what's going on, we have missed the opportunity. Awareness of the here and now, awareness of your feelings, your emotions, your mind, your thoughts, and also of your physical body. Often the physical body is where the symptom is emerging into. Right? And we'll have, uh, we'll use the tool of the breath to come back to the present moment. Breathe in, okay? Notice any tension you have in your body. Let it go. <sighs> Out it goes, okay? Now sit here, be aware, sit up straight, put your feet on the floor, breathe in deeply, okay? Be the piano. I am a piano, I have keys, people play me. What are you aware of being played? I like being played. I like being played well. All right, well, okay, go on, go on. What else are you aware of? Some people abuse me. Some people play me loudly. What are you aware of doing that? All right, so these are kind of ways we we would work with, with the existential being here in the case of the piano. Sorry, it got carried away. Ending slide. Uh, I'm going to work on putting together lecture 10 and get that out to you as soon as possible. Anyway, I hope this helps. A way to kind of catch up on what we missed last week. And uh, be on the lookout for updates. The college is supposedly going to equip us with some more software and uh, maybe even something interactive. So we'll see. Uh, continue with your readings, your study guides, and um, look over that feedback I'm sending you this week on assignment two. And um, I'll have an updated um, study guide for this week that will allow us to practice some of this stuff. Uh, anyway, be well. May the force be with you. And uh, until next time, bye.